Hey, Sanctus family, G. Andrew Beresford here. I get to be the senior pastor of Serve City Church um, in Pickering, Ontario. Uh, listen, we love you guys. We celebrate you. We're so excited about what all the Lord is doing at Sanctus everywhere. Uh, you guys are just such an incredible church. And listen, we especially love your pastors and your senior leadership. Listen, John is such an incredible leader. What a powerful gift um, to the body of Christ. And I am just honored to call him a friend, just like Sam. Um, just great gifts to the body. Um, and I'm sure that you love them just as much as we do, my family and I and Serve City Church does. And so I'm just so full of gratitude for this opportunity to be able to share with you on this morning uh, to continue in your parables series. And so, if you will, lean in for a moment. Let's just invite the Holy Spirit to come into our time, and, uh, and then we will jump right in. Uh, Almighty God, we're just so full of gratitude that you have given us another day of life, another time that we can gather here in this space to be able to hear your word. And uh, so I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would bless this time, that you open hearts and minds. Use me, O oh God, to declare your word in a way that will be impactful for your glory. I thank you and I give you praise in advance in Jesus' name. Right there where you are, say amen, amen. Listen, uh, you know, as we lean into um, this idea of uh, parables and, you know, been looking at the kingdom of God and here um, in this passage in Matthew 25, verse 14 through um, 30, Jesus shares some important things. And before I jump into that, I just want to um, start by looking back at childhood. You know, um, childhood today is a whole lot different um, than when I was growing up. You know, back in the day, in order for us to play games with our friends, our friends would have to come over. Uh, I'm a Super Nintendo guy. I don't know about y'all. Uh, any Super Nintendo peeps, let me know in the chat or maybe Sega. I don't know what your thing was. Um, you know, but back in the day, my friends had to be in the room. Now my kids, uh, they don't even have to be in the same room. I'll be talking to my sons and they'll be like, Dad, I'm playing Fortnite with some guy in Guyana, you know. Uh, and it's just amazing the ability, the technological advancements that exist today that, you know, make the experience um, even virtually a lot different than when we um, were children. Uh, not only this, man, when I was a kid, I was thinking of using my allowance or any money I had. I was trying to get, grab some penny candies. You know, <laughs> anybody remember penny candies? You remember if you found a penny, you could go to 7-Eleven or Max. I don't even know if Max still exists today, but like anybody remember Max? <laughs> you could go there, grab some sour keys, you know, things like this. I was trying to use my resources to be able to do things like that, you know. Um, but just in comparing and contrasting uh, to my kids today, yo, listen, man, my children, um, they just... They, they amaze and astonish me. Uh, the allowance that they have, these kids use it to buy things and flip them to get greater profit. I mean, my son, the other day, he bought a belt for $8. He, he used his allowance, bought a belt for $8, and he flipped that thing and um, traded it with someone for, a bre for an Apple Watch. <laughs> I mean, it's just amazing to me. I was not thinking like that when I was a kid. Not only this, I mean, he went and he bought, somebody was getting ready to throw out an Xbox. Um, the Xbox was dirty, all this stuff, they were over it. And my son got that Xbox, um, bought it for 30 bucks <laughs> with his allowance, with some of the money that he made from other things that he flipped. And he cleaned that thing up and he made $300 off of this <laughs> Xbox. I mean, it's just astonishing to me today. And now they're into like trading and he says he wants to become a millionaire before 20. Um, and so uh, the mindset of children today and how they manage resources, things like this, even just the thought process is so much different when I think of myself um, when I was a child. You know, well, with this in mind, the idea of taking what you have and multiplying it um, to being something greater or to gaining profit, towards gaining profit or um, maximizing that thing, you know, this brings us to our passage today. And I just think about what it is that Christ is 
calling us towards. Firstly, the, 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 the note in Matthew chapter 25, and we're going to dive in, and I just want to unpack it line upon line, but just to kind of give um, some, some, uh, some understanding prior to this or some thoughts prior to this. Uh, in this passage from verse 14, Jesus uses the concept of servanthood. Everybody say servanthood, right? There where you are. Servanthood to challenge us around stewardship, stewardship of what we have. Um, and, and this is very interesting because, you know, although the concept of servanthood today evokes somewhat of a visceral response initially, um, this was not the case in Bible times. You know, servanthood, um, you know, was something that was more common during this time. There were various reasons why, why people were in um, servanthood or why they were servants. Um, you know, usually we think of, of one sort of response that people are there aside from their will, you know, based upon the historicity, um, you know, of things in our kind of contemporary context. Nonetheless, people were not only in a place of servanthood because they were forced to or things like this. We see that servanthood actually was something that was voluntary. And so Jesus is uh, at times and Jesus is using um, this concept, which is common to that time, to be able to teach us something around stewardship. One more time. In fact, somebody in the chat, you can go ahead and type stewardship, stewardship. And so, in fact, Jesus says of himself, so he's not um, encouraging us to do something that he is not um, doing himself. And this is what I love about our Savior. Um, he sets this example. The Bible says um, in Matthew 23, verse 11, Jesus actually lets us know, um, he says that the greatest among you will be your servant. So he makes this clear um, that if you want to be great, you have to be a servant. Of himself, in Matthew 20, verse 28, he says, He didn't come to be served, but he came to serve. And so this concept of him coming to the earth to serve and then challenging us to let us know that the greatest among us is a servant. It's not someone who lords authority over people and, and, and is in this kind of pomp and, and um, domineering position, but it's somebody who humbles themselves as a servant, just as he did. But then talking about voluntary servanthood and this concept of finding joy, even in difficulty as it pertains to servanthood, we find people like the Apostle Paul uh, and Timothy referring to themselves voluntarily as servants of Christ. Romans chapter 1, for your reference, you can check that out from time to time. Romans chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. Um, both of those verses, they introduce themselves as servants of Christ. And so this is something that is not uncommon, um, not only in a secular context, but even in the context of Christianity. As believers, we are called to be servants of Christ and consequently to serve those who are around us. So this idea, this concept, Jesus uses this as the backdrop to be able to invite us into good stewardship. And so here now, um, in verse 14 of Matthew chapter 25, let's jump right in. The Bible declares, and I'm reading from the ESV, it says, For it, for it, for it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted them his property. Now, the it <laughs> referring to, uh, that Jesus is referring to in context in this parable, from verse 1 of chapter 25, he's referring to the kingdom of heaven. So the kingdom of God is wherever the dominion, the power, the demonstration of, of, of God's power is present, especially here in the earth. And, um, and this idea is powerful. However, Jesus now is extending this thought beyond um, what we experience here in the earth or heaven coming to earth. But this idea that one day um, there is a kingdom that is known as the kingdom of heaven. And, uh, and he is going to return and establish his visible kingdom here on the earth. And how we steward what we have right now determines our experience with that in the future. And so he says the kingdom of heaven will be like a man going on a journey. And here he's speaking of himself um, who called his servants and entrusted them his property. 
If you have a paper Bible and you're underlining, the first thing I would call you to underline is his servants. Everybody say his servants. Well, the first thing to note is that every believer belongs to Christ. Every believer belongs to Christ. And this is a powerful concept and understanding that if you are a believer, you belong to Christ. I love what uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20 encourages us, us around. It says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. He says, For you were bought with a price. Now that's very powerful right there because when we're talking about, um, you know, why is it that we are not our own? You were bought with a price. What price is this? Love. The love of God that he demonstrated to us in Christ Jesus when he died for our sins and rose from death with all power. And so this is not some idea where we are, you know, we are, we are purchased with some sort of, um, you know, minimal or, or trivial, you know, resources. But this is the, the death of God in flesh on our behalf to pay an amount that we could never pay. And this is powerful because we now are, we now belong to God. And so he ends this by saying, so glorify God in your body. And so this idea is that because you are, uh, you, every believer belongs to Christ, because of what it is that he has sacrificed for us to be his, our response now is to glorify him in our body. And this is what we're going to unpack further on today. And so he says, um, he says he's going on a journey who called his servants. And then watch, going further, he says, and entrusted to them his property. Uh, go ahead and underline his property or note in the chat, his property. So not only is ev does every believer belong to Christ, but going a step further, um, as we unpack this line upon line, everything we have belongs to God. Notice it doesn't say that, um, you know, that it doesn't only say that, um, that it was his servants, but it also says that it is his property. So we don't get to live a life where as servants of Christ, if you are a believer, we don't live a life. We don't get to live a life where we say, oh, I'm just going to do whatever I want. Uh, but we live a life that is led by um, and is positioned to glorify God. But also um, we don't get to do um, with what we have, whatever we want, because it does not belong to us. Everything we have belongs to to God. This is very important for us to know. Your children <laughs> that you have been given, they're, they're not your own. Your family, your, your spouse, the house you have, um, the car that you drive, you know, no matter how uh, rickety or how expensive that these things may be, you know, nothing you have is your own. Everything belongs to God. And this should inform the way that we are stewarding what it is that we have. And so um, with this in mind, moving onward, as we go to verse 15, it says, to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. Well, the first thing to note is, what is a talent? Somebody's like, well, what is a talent? We've heard all sorts of things around this, um, or you may be new to scripture and to these concepts. Um, and so, you know, wherever you land in that spectrum, I think it's important for us to note. So a talent um, during this time period was a monetary unit that was worth about 20 years wages for a laborer. And so the, this, is, this um, primarily is, is monetary. It is primarily a monetary um, concept, this idea of a talent. So these people are, are given varying amounts of talents, um, each equaling to about 20 years wages um, for a labor. And so this number one, of course, is inclusive of the money that is in our hand, right? But then secondarily, secondarily, it extends beyond this to anything of value that you have been given by God. And so I want you in this mind and in this time to get in your mind, what is it that you have been given by God? What is it that he 
that belongs to him that he has put in your life or in your hand. Um, this is what would, would be, be, what would be included or considered um, to be included in this concept of, um, of talent. And so this is powerful because I want you to understand it's not the individual that determines what they get. You know, even as it pertains to the gifts, because your talents and this, so of course, the money and then, but all of the various things that we have in our lives that are valuable, including your natural talents or even the gifting spiritually that you have been given by God. Where you land and where you're placed in the body of Christ, you and I, we don't, discer we don't determine that. We don't decide that. It is God who sovereignly chooses to put in our hands what it is that he has decided to put in our hands. You know, in fact, I love um, how the Apostle Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14 through 18, and how he challenges us around not um, looking down on people um, or even idolizing people because of the gifting that they have or where they're placed in the body or in the church. He says, and I'll note this in passing, verse 14, he says, For the body does does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not the hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the air should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, uh, where would the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an air, where would the sense of smell? But as it is, God, who is it? God, God arranged the members in the body, here it is, each one of them as he chose. And so it's God who has arranged the members in the body. Where you are in Christ's body, the gift set that you have, the abilities you've been given, these are all determined by God. So not only are you God's and what you have is God's, but he has been, he is the one who has determined and decided what it is that he would give. And so I want you to note this and understand that not everyone received the same amount of talents. It is imperative for us then, as we're talking about stewardship and as we're talking about the importance of being a good manager of what God has given us that belongs to him, we have to think about this, and I want to say this and I want you to grab it, we've got to act our wage. <laughs> there it is, act your wage. In fact, go ahead in the chat and put act your wage, act your wage. So based upon what you have received, it is your responsibility not to act based upon somebody else or what others have in comparison to you or whatever. You are called to act your wage, to act um, and be responsible right where you are with what you have been given. You know, God is not looking for you to be faithful beyond what he's put in your hands. And this is important for you to understand. You know, he's not looking for you to be faithful with, with, with uh, stuff down the line or anything like this. You know, tomorrow's victories are won by today's faithfulness. Ah! Listen, I get excited every now and again, so you'll have to, you'll have to excuse me. I mean, tomorrow's victories are especially won by today's faithfulness. God wants you to be faithful with what he has put in your hands right now. Act your wage right now. You know people, I mean, every now and again, maybe you know some people, you might even be one of them. Uh, I know I've been guilty from time to time in my life trying to present myself or act um, beyond what I have, where God has called me to, or to position myself to present and act like I am um, beyond where I currently am. But no, you've got, and I, if we're going to be faithful stewards of what God's put in our hand, um, we got to be intentional about making sure that we act our wage. And so moving onward, moving onward, come on with me. Let's continue to go. Uh, in verse 15, still in verse 15, notice it says that he has, He's given, uh, he gave five talents to, new, to another two, to another one. But then he goes on in that same verse and says, to each according to his ability. Uh, go ahead and underline his ability, his ability, or note that there. I want you to understand this. Your God-given responsibility is based on your God-given ability. Let me give it to you again. Pick it, pick it. Your God-given responsibility is based on your God-given ability. And so based upon, you know, what you have in your possession um, from God, 
is at to steward is based upon um, the abilities that God has given you. And so you already have everything you need uh, in order to manage and steward what it is that God has put in your hand. In a raw sense, yes, we develop and we grow and we better equip ourselves to ensure that we are operating with excellence. But in a raw sense, you and I have been given what we've been given because God has imbued you with firstly with what you need to be able to navigate even the challenges can i talk about it even the challenges that come along with you managing what it is that you have in your possession the temptations and the things that come god won't even here it is 1 corinthians 10:13 i'm just going to note this um, in passing the bible declares and says there's no temptation that's taken you that is not common to man. So what you navigate, even with difficulty, um, it's common. You know, sometimes we feel like what we're going through, nobody else is going through. But watch, he says, but God is faithful who will not suffer or allow you to be tempted above that which you are able. And so your ability also determines the level of challenge that the Lord will allow you to encounter as you are navigating and as you are stewarding what it is that he has put in your hand. So it's imperative and important for us perspective-wise to understand this. God, your God-given responsibility is based on your God-given ability. Notice I'm not saying your personal ability, but what it is that God has given you. He has positioned you for success. He has positioned you to successfully steward what it is that he's put in, in your hand. I want to say this as a side note. Uh, God has not, here it is, equipped you to manage someone else's responsibilities. <laughs> uh, let me say that one for you again. God has not equipped you to manage someone else's responsibilities. This is why it's imperative for you and I not to operate in comparison. Yeah, you are not called to manage somebody else's stuff. Many of us, we fall into the trap of comparison where we're looking at what others have and, and we're to the place where we, we think that if we had what someone else had, that then we would be better off. You know, it's like, man, if I had their wife or if I had their children or if I had their job or if I had this or that, then I would be better off or something of this nature. And it's like, no, 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 no. Stop comparing, comparing as as um, is noted, comparison kills. When we are so focused on looking at what someone else has, we lose the opportunity to properly steward what it is that God has put in our hands. And so it's imperative for us to understand you are equipped to manage what you have. And many times it's not that we would be better off um, if we had what someone else has. It's that we would be better off if we actually paid attention and leaned into what it is that God has put in our hand. And we maximize what he has put um, therein. And so this is very important for us um, as we're continuing to un continuing to unpack. And so verse 15, to each according to his ability. And then going on in that same verse, he says, then he went away. So this concept, of course, is parallel. And this is why I note um, that it's parallel. Jesus is here um, prophesying and talking about what it is that he is going to do as he's using this parable. And it is in line, it is in sync with what it is that he did. Um, and was getting ready to do in this context as he was sharing uh, in the time to come. For, uh, you know, fast forwarding a bit, in Acts chapter 1, verse 7 through 11, we see that he does this because so the master, he gives them his talents or his property, entrusts them with it, and then he goes away. Verse 7 of Acts chapter 1, it says, Then he said to them, now this is after Jesus had risen from death, um, and he's now, this is post-resurrection, he's getting ready to, um, he's getting ready to pour out the Holy Spirit on them as promised. The Bible says in verse 7, he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. And so there are many today, I'll even just note here in passing, um, that are so caught up and hung up on the time that Christ will return and establish the kingdom of heaven. And, and um, in this case, the, the Jews really thought that he was coming um, as it pertained to political, as a political power and things like this. Um, but Jesus is saying, listen, it's not time for you, it's not 
in, for you to know the times and seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, he went uh, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And so here, this is why the church, um, and as a liturgical church, Serve City, um, is we celebrate Ascension Sunday. This is one of the high days of the church as we remember um, Christ's ascending to heaven, declaring and demonstrating that he has um, defeated death, and he has accomplished his, the plan that he came to earth for. But also it foreshadows that he will return. And so after the similitude of what was noted in Matthew 25, the king or the master went away. And so he went away um, and we note this happening here. And I'll get back to the returning part um, in a little bit. But verse 16 now, Matthew 25, we're back there and we're moving on. The Bible says, he who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them. Somebody underlined, traded with them. Traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. And this is very interesting because what we note here is that these individuals, these servants of the master, of his property, um, they take what he gave to them and they go and they trade it and they multiply it. They maximize what has been put in their hand. The first two do. But the last one, what he ends up doing is that he buries this talent. And we're going to explore that a little bit further. But he does not do anything with it. He takes it and he puts it in the ground. Here's the next point for you. I just want you to note this with this in mind. You have the choice, watch, to either multiply or mismanage what you have been given by the master. Here it is. You have the choice to either multiply or mismanage what you've been given by the master. Here, um, it's very important for us to note that these individuals, this concept of multiplication, it actually um, predates and precedes uh, this, the time period Jesus was walking on the earth. Um, even before this, back to the original purpose and assignment that mankind was given by God. In Genesis 1, 28 and 29, uh, the Bible declares uh, over Adam and Eve or over mankind, the Bible says, and God blessed them. And he said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven, over the every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree which see, with seed in its fruit. You have them for food. And so this is powerful because here, the, the, the original assignment of man is to be fruitful and multiply. And of course, a lot of times we initially just take this and we um, primarily make it around childbearing. Uh, but can, yes, of course, that is included. But as with this parable, we have to expand it beyond that to meaning everything that we have that is in our hands can be seen as seed. And our responsibility and the heart of the master is for us to multiply this seed that has been put in our hand, um, whatever it looks like, to, in, to, to be to the place where um, this equals to God's glory and, and uh, redounds and gets to the place where it is in the place of faithful stewardship. Not only this, John chapter 15, verse 15 and 16, Jesus tells his disciples, who he calls friends, not just servants. He says in verse 15, No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. And of course, he's not here saying that we are not to serve. This would contradict all the other things that he is saying. But he is telling them, he's saying, you know, I'm bringing you in close so that you can have an understanding of not only my heart, but the Father's heart. 
And then he goes on and he says, I didn't, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. And so this idea of being fruitful, taking what you have and using it to glorify God by multiplying it is a concept that we see not only in the Old Testament and in the purpose of man, and I could point elsewhere, but for the sake of time, uh, we'll continue to move, uh, but then also within the commission of Christ to be fruitful. But not only this, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, the Bible declares and says, um, so whatever you, uh, what, whether you eat or you drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So again, this idea of utilizing what has been placed in our hand, multiplying it, maximizing it for God's glory. We're not operating, whether even as it pertains to what we are eating, drinking, what we're doing. We're not, we're not living unto ourselves. We're not making these decisions based on what's just going to be the best for me. But we are thinking about how we can use these things to glorify God. So we all have this choice as to how we are going to steward. The opposite is burying it, like we see the person with one did. But verse 19, as we move on, and, and, and actually, you know what, before I even go there, I just feel compelled to share this. Like, you know, you, we all have a choice. You have a choice as to how you're going to steward what's in your hand. It doesn't matter if your bloodline and people in the past, in your um, context, that they stewarded resources or, you know, um, or even their family or their marriage a certain way or in a way that was negative or problematic. You and I, no matter what has happened in our family or in our circle of influences, we have a choice to be able to walk forward in a different way and to be good stewards and good managers of what God has been put in our hand. I, don't let Satan lie to you that, well, well, because my parents were, you know, operating in debt and because they were to the place where they spent, you know, more money than they actually had and all this stuff and whatever and became a slave to the lender, that's the way that I have to. No, you don't have to operate. You can equip yourself. You can um, become a good steward of your resources. Don't follow the patterns, uh, the negative patterns of the past. Just wanted to share that with somebody. Verse 19, the Bible goes on and says, Now after a long time, somebody say a long time, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. If you remember back to Acts chapter 1, uh, when we were just talking about the ascension of Christ, there were two men that were standing there, but the disciples were looking and they're like, oh my gosh, where is, where is he going? And they said, listen, don't, don't trip. <laughs> he says the, the same way that he came up, is the way that he is coming back. I especially noted that after a long time part, because I mean, you know, it has seemed like it is a really long time since Christ, um, since Christ has gone, right? It's literally been thousands of years. And many people, um, their heart begins to grow weak and weary and things like this. Uh, but the fact is, I just want to offer some encouragement around um, the note that Christ is coming back. He's coming back. Even though it's been a long time, even though it seems like the master has been gone for a while, I want you to know that he is coming back. He, he, is, he will not leave us stranded here. He has fulfilled all of his previous promises and he will continue to fulfill his promises. I love John 14 verses 1 through 3. The Bible actually tells us, Jesus says to his disciples, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, the Father. Uh, believe also in me. He says, in my father's house are many rooms or many mansions. He says, if it were not so, I would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And, I, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Oh man, that's some good news right there. And so uh, I want you to understand that although it may seem like a long time, we still have the assurance that Christ will return when he uh, return for us. And, and with this in mind, it says after a long time, he, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Now I want you to note this, this settling of, an account, of accounts is um, a form of accountability. Or well, there is judgment that happens here in this moment around how um, these servants of the master stewarded what they were given. Let me just note this here. Here's this point for you. We all must give an account for our stewardship. Here it is. We all must give an account for our stewardship. 
Yeah, uh, there are many of us, we think that, you know, uh, even as believers that we are just, you know, we can be willy-nilly, we can do whatever it is that we want with that which has been given to us. No, and, you know, and, and we'll be scot-free. No, 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 no. Um, the Bible is clear that everyone, unbelievers and believers, will all have to give an account for what we did. In the book of Daniel, um, so in the Old Testament, this concept um, is therein as well. And we find kind of a general judgment um, that is noted here. Uh, and it talks about this time. It says in verse 1 and 2, At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of the people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. Verse 2, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and contempt. Now, uh, Daniel is kind of envisioning here a general judgment that is to take place. Here also, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, the Bible says here in the New, in the New Testament, and just that is, as it is appointed uh, for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. Here's this idea, there, there, there will be a judgment. And then now, even for believers, because there are two types of judgment. There's a judgment for believers, but then uh, this differs from the judgment for unbelievers. But even for believers, because many of us think that as believers, we don't have to give an account. I'm not going to read um, the judgment of unbelievers in Revelation 20, verse 11 through 15. I'll just note that, and you can check it out in your personal study time. But 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, the Bible says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So here the context of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is especially of believers. This is not to determine um, where we will spend eternity. That was determined by our trust and our faith in Christ. However, we still have to give an account for what we did in our body. And so going to verse 20, and I'm almost done. I, I hope you're tracking with me and that you'll grab from this. Verse 20, the Bible says, And he who had received the five talents, so here comes the master, came forward bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. This is some powerful stuff here because uh, we know that God gives those who stewarded the resources that he gave them well, the master gives, th gives them a well done. Come on, I'm telling you, I am not living this life for a pat on the back. You and I, we should not be living this life for the approval or the applause of men more than we are a well done from Christ. To hear him say, well done, my good and my faithful servant. You have stewarded well what I have put in your hand. Now, I want you to note this because a lot of people um, get this messed up and we think that the well done is a congratulations for your earning salvation. No, 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 no. This is not them earning their salvation. Their stewardship uh, is not works that puts them into heaven. You know, this is instead a response to our faithful stewardship. So God's well done is not a congratulations for earning salvation. It's a response to our faithful stewardship of what it is that he has put in our hands. Verse 22, uh, the Bible ends up going on and saying, And he who also had two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made two talents more. So here's this guy doing this. Verse 23, his master said to him, well done. Here it is again. Um, and he says, you have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much, over much. Now, I want you to note this. Each of the servants was rewarded for their faithful stewardship of what they were given, not the amount of money they returned to the master. So notice he doesn't say, uh, you know, now you can enter into joy because you gave five and, you know, as opposed to the other guy who just gave two. No, 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 no. It's just based on the well done is attached to your faithful stewardship of whatever it has been, has been put in your hand. As you're serving here in church, and I hope that you're serving at your church, I want to encourage you. And if, you're, if you are, 
How are you stewarding what it is that God has given you? Are you just like opening the door like, okay, welcome home. But, you know, how you steward what has been placed in your hand determines um, determines this well done that you get. You can be going to heaven and all of that. Uh, but ultimately, the call on our lives is to do so um, and to walk in being able to say, God, by your grace, look at how I have stewarded what it is that you have put in my hand. Now, moving onward um, and bringing the plane down for a landing, here we find a gentleman who operates in a different way. Verse 24 says, And he who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. So here, this guy represents bad stewardship. He, instead of multiplying, being fruitful, instead of being in this position, this individual buries the talent and gives this thing back to him. But not only this, he also has a misunderstanding of the heart of the master and is operating in fear. Can I tell you this? Bad stewardship is often attached to a misunderstanding of the master's heart and is oftentimes rooted in fear. He says, I thought you were a, in other words, I thought, as we would say in Toronto, I thought you were a waste you. <laughs> I thought you were someone um, that was unfair and unjust and, and, and consequently I'm operating in fear and I'm hiding what, uh, what I need to hide. You know, oftentimes our bad stewardship comes as a result of a misunderstanding of the heart of the master, which leads to us operating in fear, sometimes because of the difficulty that we're facing. Sometimes because of the challenges that come our way, God could not be a good God based upon what it is that I'm navigating. Well, can I tell you that we serve a God uh, as Romans 8, 28 lets us know uh, that to those of us who love him and are called according to his purpose, as we see here in this passage, that he is able to work all things together for good. So even in difficult times, we uh, can celebrate the fact that our God is a good God, that his Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22 declares the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. He is a faithful God. He's a loving God. He is a good God. Even when things don't make sense in our lives, we can trust him and still steward what we have in times of difficulty, knowing that he can, uh, that he can cause those things to multiply. And in the time to come, in the, in the future, turn them around um, for our good and for his glory. I want you to understand this, that this individual, his sentiments towards the master and the fruit thereof were evidence that, watch, that he was, he may not have been in, in true relationship with that individual, with the master. Not only this, uh, you know, this could have been to the place where his heart grew cold towards him. And so, I, you know, if you're to that place where you have been given something and you're not doing anything with it, is it because of this misunderstanding? Is it because you need to truly trust Christ and enter relationship with the master? Or is it because your heart has grown cold because of difficulty and God is calling you back to himself and saying, hey, you know, you can come and you can repent if it's sin or, or you can be healed. I'm close to the brokenhearted if, it's, if you're someone that is, that is experiencing difficulty in your heart. But here in the passage, and uh, we're, we're, we're almost done. The Bible says in verse 26, but his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gathered where I scattered no seed. And he asked it in a question mark because he's like, listen, man, you, you really thought that's who I was? You don't know me, he said. Then you ought to have at least invested my money with the bankers and at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. And then he says, so take the talent from him and give it to him who has 10 talents. And so this is really interesting because this guy suffers loss because he did not appropriately steward what was put in his hand. But I want to also note this and, and, and just lean in because somebody, uh, just lean in, come in, come in, lean in, lean in to me real quick. I want you to understand that there's someone, watch, uh, this guy did nothing with what he had because of a heart issue, okay? Um, because he had a heart issue, but many of us do nothing because we feel like what we have is too small or too insignificant for God to use. So you might be like, well, you know, that's not me. I don't think God is evil, but I feel like what I have is too small. Uh, you know, I feel like, I, I want you to understand, here's a point for you. Good stewardship is not determined by quantity. 
What you have is not too small for God to be able to do something big with. What you have, you can still take it and multiply it and make it fruitful for God's glory. That little talent that you have, whatever it is, and you feel like, man, could anybody care about this? Could God really use this? Does God really care? He gave me this little thing. Listen, again, God is looking for you to be faithful with what he's given you. And he will cause what you have, no matter how small it is, to be multiplied if you would be faithful with it. I love growing up in a, a West Indian home. Any West Indian people <laughs> watching, I remember growing up, man, one of the things that was astonishing to me, and even if you were not in a West Indian context like me, my mom, in times of difficulty, was able to take the couple cans of beans and the things that we had and whatever to feed our family. And sometimes she would even be able to feed others and be a blessing to others. And I celebrate my parents and how they use what they did, what they had, even when it was little, uh, setting that example of how to steward it and multiply it and use it to be a blessing to others. So good stewardship is not determined by quantity. Here it is. Do something. Do something with whatever you've been given. He says, if you, you thought I was what, even if you had a misunderstanding, you could have at least done something. You should never do nothing. <laughs> he says, you should have taken what I had, invested it, at least I would have got some interest, man. Uh, and so do something with whatever it is that you're given. And so I'm, I'm done now. We're bringing the plane down. Verse 29, uh, the Bible says, for to everyone who has will more be given and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And then he says, and cast the worthless servant into outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So here, this guy who um, clearly does not have the heart of the master, it seems as if he's not even truly in relationship with him, or his heart grew cold and he died in this sort of a position. But ultimately, he was, he, he suffered loss and he was degraded. He was sent out because of his lack of stewardship, which was indicative of uh, his lack of good stewardship, which was, which was indicative of the fact that he probably was not truly in relationship with God. But we see that although this is his end, although this is his end, which is a very real end for those who um, would not submit to the lordship and the leadership of Christ, we see that there, um, that there is a very real possibility, even for those of us who will be with Christ eternity, to still, eternally, to still suffer loss. I'm going to end on that, but before I, I note this, I want you to understand, good stewardship, here's the point, leads to joy and elevation. That's what we're seeing in the passage. I'm not making it up. Poor stewardship ends in loss and degradation. Fick it, fick it. Let me give it to you again. Good stewardship leads to joy and elevation eternally, ultimately. Poor stewardship ends in loss and degradation. And so, um, you know, there is, even in this time today, when you and I poorly steward what is in our hands, there are consequences right now. But there are eternal consequences, one we see here in the passage, but even for believers who will ultimately end up in heaven. I want to note this, and this is the, the passage that I'm done with. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10 through 15. The Bible says, According to the grace of God given to me like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. And someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation, here it is. This is the, now he compares and contrasts the types of ways that we steward, what we build with. The materials that he's referring to are indicative of the type of stewardship, whether good or poor, of what we, how we build with what's been put in our hands. He says, um, the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, and then he goes on and now says, wood, hay or straw. Each one's work will become manifest for the day. The day, if you, in your translation, it might have a capital D for day, noting the day of judgment, like we were talking about, where Christ will come back and we have to give an account um, when we stand before him. We'll disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. And this, of course, is proverbial. And the fire will test which sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, 
he will receive a reward, just like we see in the passage, right? Um, and then he says, if anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, like we saw in the passage, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. And so here, it is very possible for you to go to heaven <laughs> and suffer, still suffer a form of loss based upon poor stewardship of what has been put in your hand. And so I want to call you to understand it's not just enough for you to know that you are a servant of Christ and that you, are, you belong to Christ and all of this. But my question to you is, how are you stewarding? How am I stewarding what it is that God has put in our hands that belongs to Him? It's not enough for us to just to go to heaven, but are we stewarding it in a good way or are we stewarding it in a poor way? I challenge you to steward what you have in your hand, multiply it, be fruitful with it, do with it what um, should be done to bring glory to God so that when Christ returns, both you and I can hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter in to the joy of your Lord. God bless you.